<laughs> All right, if you guys want to open up your Bibles to John chapter 4. We're going to cover the rest of the chapter, verses 46 through 54. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for being our God. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness and for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy and grace, Lord. We surrender our hearts to you this morning. and We ask, Lord, that you would prepare us for your word, that you prepare us to take in that which you have for us. That as we surrender to your word, that you would cut away from us the things, Lord, that we have allowed to be tied to us. And that we would surrender everything to you, Lord. That not only would you cut away the things that don't belong in us, but that you would fill us with what does belong in us, with who belongs in us, you, Lord. I pray that all who hear your words this morning, that they would surrender to you, to your word, to your call in their lives. We love you so much, Lord. I pray that you would uh, be the teacher this morning, that your Holy Spirit would move mightily, that your Holy Spirit, Father, would... uh, that he would be the power here. and Get me out of your way, Lord. Get me out of my own way, Lord. Just have your way this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. When I was a kid, my best one of my best friends told me that he was a player for the Dallas Cowboys. Well, in my, uh, yeah, you know, I was like, but that's, that's how I felt. But, you know, when you're a kid, like, so there's a, a simple way to test his claim. Prove it. So he went inside, came back out with helmet, pads, jersey, pants, shoes. I was like, holy crap, you're a Dallas Cowboy. I was like, it's like you know, we're just kids. My, I mean, seven, probably, I don't know, but you're a Dallas Cowboy. I told him to prove it. He went and he proved it. Obviously, he wasn't a cowboy, but, you know, back in the day, you probably still could buy your kids the little outfits for football teams. And... As I got a little older, I remember one of my friends said that he could do 50 pull-ups without stopping. You know what I told him? Prove it. So he did 50 pull-ups, and I was like, dang, all right. You could do 50 pull-ups. Cool. And then I remember not too long ago uh, when I was working in the shops, one of the guys says, I could do a backflip just from standing straight. Prove it. You know, that's, that's the good old burke language, right? Prove it. You know, that's... Because I don't believe you. Like, why should I trust your word? Prove it. So he did a backflip. And I was like, all right, you can do a backflip. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was going to land on his head, but, you know, he didn't. So prove it. This is how people often come to Jesus. When we come to the Lord, we often have an attitude of prove it. Prove it, Lord. Jesus says things about us, and we don't believe him, so we prove it. And too many Christians live like this. We live questioning his word. And we want him to prove himself rather than believing what he said because he's worthy to be believed. You know, when uh, my friends proved it, after that, their word gained weight with me. And that's how it is, right? When somebody lies, can you hold their word to the fire? Because why? It burns up. It's worth nothing. It doesn't hold its weight in truth. But when somebody proves to be true, what they say has weight to their words. Now, for most of us in here, we've experienced the power of Christ. We've seen the power of his truth. We've felt the weight of his truth. And so when he says something, we don't need him to prove anything because he's already proved the more important things. Has anybody in here ever been transformed by Jesus? Changed? You used to be one way and now you're another? That's a pretty weighty truth, right? And if he did that, then how much simpler is it to believe the simple things? Like you're forgiven. Like you're a new creation. Like you're mine. But for some reason, you know, and maybe it's just the way we're raised, maybe it's just the flesh, there's a constant knack within humanity, within the flesh, where we want the Lord to prove it. Today we're going to see that's the attitude of the Jews. It's one of the reasons that the Jews are constantly asking him for a sign. Can you imagine raising someone from the dead? And then they come to you and say, oh yeah, well just show us a sign and we'll believe. Show you a sign. This fool was dead. (laughs) He was wrapped up. We're not in Lazarus today, but you know, he wrapped up for three days. 
he stunketh. You know, and he raised him from the dead. Jesus raised a widow's son from the dead. Jesus gave sight to the blind. He made the lame walk. He gave speech to the dumb, hearing to the deaf. Multiplied seven fish and or what, seven loaves and two fish, a couple loaves and a couple fish to feed thousands. Miracle after miracle after miracle. And the Jews maintain the attitude all the way up into the end, all the way till he's on the cross dying. Give us a sign. Come down from the cross and we'll believe. The attitude of the it's the attitude of a hard heart, to be honest. But that's the attitude of the Jews. In chapter 4, verse 46, we pick up Jesus coming back to the Galilee. In the last couple teachings, we saw that Jesus had to go through Samaria. And he had to go through Samaria for a simple purpose, for a divine appointment, to meet the woman at the well, to meet the what we would call the unforgivable, to meet what we would call the detestable, to meet what we would call the only kind of person that's not worthy of receiving the grace of God. He had to go there to meet this person. And in meeting this person, she believed. She was transformed. She went into the city and she told the only other people that she knew, which were the guys, because she didn't hang out with girls because she was skanking it, you know, and that's what happens when you're skanking it. You just know a bunch of dudes. And so... The dudes believe, and many of them come to Christ on account of her testimony. And it says they flocked to him. And then they invited him into the city. Then they asked him to stay, and he, he accepts the request. And he stays, and it says many came. We don't know how many, whether you know the entire town or most. It, it appears at least most of the town. Most of them heard his words, and they believed him. And so... After that, he heads off up back home. Because remember, Samaria is right in between where Jesus is doing the majority of his ministry in Jerusalem. So he heads on out, going north. And you guys remember the first city who had passed going back home? His original hometown, Nazareth. And he says, eh, prophet's not without honor except in his hometown. And we talked about that. We, we, we cross-referenced the passages where Jesus went back to Nazareth and they refused to believe him. And understandably, we know how that is, right? When you know somebody and then they have a life-changing experience. Now, you want to validate that experience because you want it to be true. But then it's like, well, I know you. You know, that's how it was when I got born again. I just wanted to win my family. But my family really wasn't having it because they knew me. So I just went to everybody else. And with time, as, as you know, years passed, my family realized, all right, this isn't going away. This is who he's become. God has actually done a work in him. And it took years. It didn't just, you know, I was up riding their case from day one. Oh, gotta get born again. Gotta get, gotta get in. Gotta, Jesus, Jim. <laughs> Smacking him with the Bible, essentially, you know. And, but they knew who I was. As a matter of fact, some of my family even said, it's just a season. It'll be over soon. One of my family members really wanted to get high. This guy. It's like, I don't do that anymore. Give us some time. You'll be back. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I ain't coming back, fool. Like, that's not me anymore. But that's how it is. And so when Jesus goes home to Nazareth, we know who you are, the carpenter's son. Sorry for the language, but this is, this is, well, we're going to see this as we go forward, so just get ready. But the one born out of wedlock, they call Jesus his mother a whore. Yeah, the Jews do that, and they do it often because she had a child outside of wedlock. Now, we know that she wasn't a whore. We know that she was, she had an immaculate conception. The Spirit of God came upon her and did an incredible, did a miracle, just like God promised in Isaiah. Chapter 14, that he would do this wonderful work. A virgin would give birth. Or is it seven? That's 14. And, but they couldn't conceive that. So they considered her a whore. And we're going to see, they're going to call her that here in John chapter 10 going forward. So just be prepared. I'm not calling her that. That's what the Jews called her. That's how they viewed her. They viewed Jesus as a bastard. I'm sorry, that, that's what they viewed him as. Again, you know, I just want to make a disclaimer here. I use these particular words because this is the weight of how the story is written. 
and I don't like that the church churches up the words, and we make it not as significant. We make it less weighty than it really is. And even with sin, right, we don't call sin sin anymore. We call them mistakes, right? No, no, it's a sin. You've sinned against a holy, righteous God, and you deserve to go to hell for those sins. You know, I don't like churching up the text. But that gives weight to the magnitude of what's being said. But they don't accept him there because we know you. We know who your dad is. We know who your mom is. We know your brothers and sisters. We and he says he could do very little works there, so he keeps going. He goes up to Galilee. He goes to Cana, Cana of Galilee. <coughs> Excuse me. In verse 46, it says, Therefore he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made water, the water wine. And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now, it says, therefore, give, cha changing the story, but connecting it to the last passage because of what was previously said. The Galileans received him, but it appears they were more concerned about signs and wonders and miracles and things of that nature rather than him. So he goes to Cana rather than back to Capernaum or Capernaum. We're going to see that Jesus does the majority of his work in this little tree out of cities. When you get to the top of Galilee, you have Capernaum right there by the lake shore. You go a little up, you have Chorazin, and then you go a little bit see, west, you have Bethsaida. And that's where he does the majority of his work. And we're going to see that by and far they reject him. And he's going to curse those three cities because it's going to be there that he does the majority of his work. This is where the headquarters of his ministry is, Capernaum. And then he travels through these three cities most often, and he does most of his works there. And they're going to get cursed and become ruins. To this day, I've been to those three cities, they're rocks. You go there, there's nothing. The Sea of Galilee is teeming with life and business and it's beautiful and it's good. And then you got these three little cities that today are still rubble. And there'll never be anything more. Well, Jesus cursed them. He said, you're cursed. You'd be nothing. God came here and you rejected God. But he goes to Cana. And it says an official's son, a royal official's son, was sick at Capernaum. Now, this royal official, we don't know who he is. Lots of cool speculation. I'm not going to get into it because we have better things to talk about at this particular moment. But he's sick at Capernaum. And so he comes down to Cana to retrieve Jesus. Now, something that I do want to take note of is he goes to Cana because all they want is miracles out of him. They want him to do signs. They want him to do wonders. When we get to verse 48, he's even going to make the statement, you guys just won't believe and that's how I, I do a tap dance for you, will you? I didn't say it in those words, but essentially. Now, this is a stark contrast. Because when we look at the previous texts, when he went to Samaria, these are their enemies. These are where they're not welcome. These are the people that they're at war with. They've been at war with for several hundred years now. And yet, when he goes there, they accept his testimony with no miracles. There's not a single miracle that's recorded being done in Samaria through John chapter 4. Not a single one. Nothing. He does nothing. He goes and he tells them the truth. They hear the truth. They believe the truth. He comes to his own. He tells them the truth. They refuse to believe. He does miracles. They refuse to believe. They just want more miracles. There's a stark contrast here between the Samarians, the Samaritans, and the Jews. I want you to take note also, the Samaritans, they didn't just believe his word. They believed the word of a whore. A transformed whore, no longer a whore, now a child of God. They took her word. Mind you, she went to the well and then came back with this message. It's not like she had been living for several years and they noticed how righteous she would become. No, she went to the well and came back, same clothes, same stink, same look. Just a different twinkle in her eye. Right? Different words, different message. They saw, they heard, they believed based on what she said. They didn't have to see a single work done and they went. Then they heard for themselves and they believed. And they invited him in. Stay with us, man. Stay with us. Now again, he's in Galilee. This royal official comes down. Um, the royal official was likely a royal official of Herod Antipas. 
and we're not going to get into it just again because of time, but there were a family named Herod. Herod the Great primary, primarily is the guy we think of. We think of Herod. The dude was a whack job. I'm not going to get into him. One of these days we will. I've done studies on this guy, and he's an interesting historical figure. But he had several sons. And when he died, I mean, he was, a, he was beloved of Rome. He was an incredible architect. He was actually the one who set forth to rebuild the temple to its magnificent glory that it was in Jesus' day. It was considered one of the wonders of the world. But he was a whack job. He like, killed several of his wives, several of his kids. And it was out of jealousy. Like if he, if he got any kind of inkling that you were eyeing his throne, even if you were the son set to take the throne, if he felt like, oh, you want this throne, he would have your throat cut. Yeah, his kids, his wives, sister, didn't matter who you were. He was a jealous man. He was a paranoid man, kind of like Saul. We're going to see Saul tonight. Jealous, paranoid, willing to kill for his position. Well, when he dies, because eventually everybody dies. You know, everybody dies. When he died, his, his kingdom was split up by the Roman Empire, the emperor, four ways. He went to three of his sons and one of his daughters. Well, the son here, Antipas, took the Galilean region, so they're, they're tetrarchs. It's split four ways. And we're going to see some of the other Herods going forward. We'll talk maybe a little bit more about Herod then. But it's likely he's a royal official in his kingdom, in his harem, so to speak, his, his, his court, this royal official. He, he appears to be nobody significant. You know, a butler works in the royal court. So we don't know what his position is, just that he worked in the royal court. And he comes down to Cana to retrieve Jesus and it says because his son was sick at Capernaum in verse 47 it says when he heard that Jesus had come out of Galilee I'm sorry when he had heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death his son was at the point of death so he goes down to Cana which is you know I've seen I was trying to find an exact length of how far Capernaum was to Cana and most sources cite between 20 and 25 miles there's not like a definite maybe the, the, the trails were different than I don't know but a good one stopped at 23.6 miles so I'm going to say that but we'll just say between 20 and 25 miles it's a good distance so it's not like you hop in a car and you know, drive up to Bernalillo no you're on foot or you're on horseback and mind you if it's the heat of the day you have to be careful how far you travel you get your horse killed you get yourself killed and so it, it's not like it's an easy task just jumping on and going like it is in our day where you can go drive you know 2,000 miles in a day could you drive 2,000 miles in a day that's a lot huh what's, what's a good a long drive uh, 600 miles that's 700 miles that's fair right? that's pain in the butt right there you know that's a long drive we can do that today back then 20 miles was like pushing it so between 15 and 20 miles would be the average ability of a day's journey and so he gets on and whoa, he gets on and he goes down to Capernaum he goes he doesn't send somebody else which makes me wonder how high he up is in the how high up he is in the royal court he's probably not very high up Otherwise, I would imagine he had sent a butler and stayed with his sick son. But he doesn't. He goes. And who knows, maybe he just felt like it was his responsibility, which is good if you're a father. But he goes because his son is sick to death. The urgency of the need compelled the man to travel the distance to go and meet Jesus. Which draws me to a point. Tragedy has a way of drawing people to Christ. I know when we see tragedy, sometimes we immediately look at it from the human aspect. But the truth is, tragedy has a way of pulling us in, right? Often people, you'll often see people walk away from the faith, or they get lazy in the faith, or whatever the case may be, and something happens that reignites that fire that once sat within their soul. Often it's death. When you see lazy Christians... When they're faced with their mortality, when they're faced with the reality of, of, of death, they'll often, that flame will be reignited and a fire will spark within them. Tragedy isn't always necessarily bad. I mean, I'm not saying it's good, but God wastes nothing. I know that we hurt when people pass, right? But the reality is that's the way of life. You know, my family ran a mortuary for 70 plus years. You know, I learned one thing in that time that that business was run. 
every single person will die. Nobody escapes. I know we're all trying to beat it. I see these little YouTube videos of Elon Musk. Yeah, we're going to be able to beat death. You know, we're going to be able to transfer the consciousness of a person into a machine. Nah, I think that's garbage. I don't think you're going to be able to do that. Download somebody's soul and put it. It's not, I don't think it's possible. I hope it's not possible. If it does, I hope that crap short circuits and blows up on you. Because you can play God like that, man. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Our bo God didn't intend it to be that way yet. There is coming a time where immortality will be attainable. It'll be in the new age. It'll be when God recreates and when God restores and when we're renewed into the way God intended us to be built and to live life the way he intended us to live life. Till then, we're all going to die. Nobody gets out. Nobody escapes it except for one generation. Which generation is that? It's the generation of the rapture. They're the only ones who will never experience death in the natural cause. They'll be transformed in a unique way. They'll be taken up immediately, the Bible says, in the twinkling of an eye, and they'll be transformed immediately into a resurrected body. But otherwise, we're all going to face death. Nobody escapes. I know we all want to escape. We all want to avoid it. We, we don't want to think about it. We don't like to think about it. But the truth is, we ought to think about it. And if you don't, when that tragedy strikes... If you're unprepared, it can take you to a dark place. Or it can reignite the fire within you. A good friend of mine, his dad just passed. And we we're talking, and I told him, I was like, look, man, one or two things is going to happen. I said, either you're going to be angry at God for your dad passing, and you're going to push further away from the faith, or you're going to allow this as an opportunity for God to reignite that love that you have for him in your heart. And it looks like he's going the latter way. It looks like he's accepting what God has done. He's understanding that it's not bad. And that he's using it as a catapult forward to get strong in his faith again. That's good. Tragedy strikes, people come to Christ. Now, not only when tragedy strikes does it have a way of drawing people to Jesus, but desperation has a way of bringing people to surrender. Tragedy might bring you to Christ, but it doesn't mean you're going to surrender to him. A lot of people walk through the doors of the church. I don't know what they look for sometimes. As a matter of fact, especially in the West, a lot of people walk through the doors of church looking for entertainment. Right? I can't tell you how many people I know that go to some of these big churches, not because the message is solid, but because they have something to offer them. One of the big ones I hear is, it's like a concert when we go, man. And I'm like, well, if it's okay, like that's cool. But were you edified? Or was it just cool? Was it, was it just like a concert? Was your soul fed? Was the worship real worship? Or was it just a concert? A lot of people walk into the church, but they're not desperate. You guys know what desperation is? It's being on that last string. You have no other way to turn. You're at the point of hopelessness. Desperation is powerful. It's dangerous, but it's powerful. And one thing that I've learned about desperation is, again, the one who's desperate is the one who's willing to surrender to Christ. And that person is willing to experience the fullness of His grace. The desperate Hearted. Desperation is beautiful. Tragedy has struck this royal official's house and he's desperate. He's perfectly primed to walk in the grace of Christ. I wrote this in my notes, so I'll just ask you how many of us in here walk in defeat as Christians? You know, don't raise your hand, but how many of us here walk in defeat? You try and you try. And you try, and you, you keep trying to do what's right. You keep trying to be righteous. You keep trying not to sin, but you're always walking in defeat. You want to know why you continue to walk in defeat? It's because you're not desperate. You're not surrendered. You are relying on your strength. <laughs> and that's, that's the plight of humanity. It's pride. Like, we want to surrender to Jesus, but... We also want to, I want to do it myself. This can-do attitude that, you know, we grew, we grew up with. 
Even as kids, right? Have you ever seen like a kid when, you know, you're teaching them to do things? I want to do it. I want to do it. And understandable, but when you come to Christ, there's not really anything you can do but get in God's way. Sounds a little, you know, a little foolish, but that's, that's the reality. The more you try to help God out, the more you find yourself down the barrel. A desperate heart comes to the point where I, I have nothing left to try. Lord, I have nothing. I don't know what to do. Surrender. Surrender. That's what you can do. You can surrender and allow God to work righteously through you. Surrender is powerful. Desperation is powerful. This royal official, he's desperate. Look at it again in verse 47. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. When it says he was imploring him, it's the Greek word erotao, and it literally means he begged him. He begged him. This guy is in the royal court, and he comes to this Jewish rabbi. Now, mind you, Jesus wasn't, I mean, rabbis often dressed nice and looked good, probably smelled good, you know, put on their Shabbat best. Eh, Jesus was a dirty old dude. He walked around sweating up and down the, 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 the Israeli desert, going from north to south, you know. He's probably a smelly dude. The Bible tells us he wasn't very good looking. There's nothing great about him that we should desire him. And this guy comes to this sweaty, dirty, rogue preacher. Rogue for the time. It's not that he was rogue, it's just for the Judean standard, for, for the Jewish with their requirements, he was considered rogue. He wasn't from any of their schools. He didn't teach any of their doctrines. He did his own thing. He did it the right way, might I add, but not according to them. They had a lot of issues with Jesus. And this guy goes to him, and he begs him. Can you imagine the weight of this heart, the heart of this father, the, the weight in his heart? Your son is dying. That puts you in a desperate position, right? I don't care if you're stinky, tall, short, fat, curly-headed, or bald. Help my son, please. Come with me, please. My son is dying. And then Jesus says in verse 48. This is a really harsh thing. He says, so Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Raw truth has a way of transforming. Again, it's why I use some of the language I use. I know it's, it's, I know it's not common. I know, I know it's going to offend some people. probably offend some of you. And I'm sure it'll offend some people to the point where they'll even leave. That always baffles me when people aren't willing to take raw reality. We always want it seasoned up, right? Throw some salt on it or something. Make it more palatable. But have you ever been to the doctor? And, and or let's, let's back up here. Imagine going to the doctor. Say, oh yeah, there's a little lump right here. Oh, don't worry about it. It's just a lump. You know, we all get them. You're getting old, you know. And no, don't worry. It's just a lump. And you know, think of it as a third boob. Yeah, I don't know. Oh my <laughs> you know, I don't know. But you know, just. just it's not a big deal. Don't don't worry. Oh, you're beautiful the way you are. And you come back two years later and oh, it grew a little bit. Oh well, you know every girl's dream, I guess. You know. And then your energy levels are dying down, and oh, it turns out that was cancer. This whole we knew it was cancer, but we didn't want to tell you it was cancer because then you'd be worried, and then you'd have to get chemo, and then you know what well, we really just wanted you to just you know. We didn't, we didn't want you to worry, so we didn't tell you. How would you feel? Oh, it smacked the daylights out of that doctor. Who cares about prison? You're going to die. <laughs> at that point, like, you're on, a, you're on a death sentence anyway. You smacked the daylights out of that doctor. And I feel like that's what the church has done so much by and far. Just, we're just... We just want people to just feel comfortable. So we're just going to tell you, we're going to tell you comfortable truths. 
We don't want to be uncomfortable because, you know, uncomfortability makes you have to move and squirm and change. You know, if you're sitting in a seat and it's not comfortable, you just stay sitting there, right? What do you do when your seat's uncomfortable? You move. I want you guys to be uncomfortable because I don't want you to just be where you are forever. We need to be moved. We need to be changing Tomorrow you shouldn't be the same as you are today. Next year, if next year you're the same Christian you are today, you're doing it wrong. But I feel like I got a good grasp grasp today. Yeah, but the closer you get to Jesus, this is how this works, right? The closer you get to the Lord, the brighter the light gets. The brighter the light gets, the more you are visible, the more you're able to see about yourself. The more you're able to see about yourself, the more jacked up you realize you are. My auntie used to have this mirror as a kid, you know, and you see, used to be on her desk. It was like a little round mirror on a swivel. And when you look at one side, it's just a normal mirror. And you flip it, boom, magnifies. All of a sudden, everything's all big. It's probably to pluck out their hair noses and stuff, right? <laughs> but, you know, right? You're looking in that mirror. What do you start to notice? Especially if it's got the little ring light around. What do you start to notice about yourself? You start to notice everything. Start to notice all the little pore and you're like, are those blackheads? What are those? You know, it's my skin looks like this, this close, and then if that light adjusts and it gets brighter, it's even worse. Because it's just it keeps revealing things about you that you weren't able to see. So people have this thought that the closer you get to Jesus, the better you'll be. Nah, the closer you get to the Lord, the more like crap you feel. Not because you want to feel like that. It's because the more you realize you're falling short. It's a good thing. Because it shows you your need of Him. It's good. If you get closer to Jesus and you feel better about yourself, you're probably looking at the wrong. It's probably the devil. Because the Bible tells us He appears as an angel of light. So if you get closer to that light and you're like, I really like what I see. It ain't Jesus, man. I'll tell you right now. You're, you're, you're talking to and looking at something else. One of my heroes, the Apostle Paul. This is what he had to say towards the end of his life. I would say towards the climax of his incredible walk, incredible knowledge, incredible grace. That dude was just a ball of grace. and just That dude was incredible. Towards the end of his life, he says this, I am the chief of sinners. I am the worst of everybody. You're all bad. I'm way more jacked up than you. I understand Paul. Because the closer he got to the Lord, the more he learned, the closer he got, the more he realized, I don't have it together as I thought I did. The more I study the scriptures, the more I realize I don't have it together as much as I thought I did. Back up 10 years, I thought I was perfect. I was just a baby Christian, all stupid, like 15, 12 years, 13 years. Because I'm getting older. I, sometimes my dates get mixed up in my... I'm telling you, I'm getting old. You guys don't believe me, but I am. But back up like 12, 13 years, 14 years, I really thought that I was like perfect. And I was like God's gift to humanity. I, was, I, I really thought like, what would God do without me? Yeah, I know. It's crazy, right? And the more I learn, the more I'm like, man, I, I, I just don't have a grasp on it the way I wish I did. I was talking to a good friend of mine, my friend whose dad passed the other night. I told him, man, I wish that I was better. He's like, no, you're doing good. I said, nah, dog, you don't understand. Like, I just, there's so many areas that I still fail. I just wish I didn't, man. He's like, no, but you're doing good. I said, nah, but I'm not. You know, because I see where I'm falling. As I compare myself to Jesus, as I continue to compare myself to the scriptures, man, I'm still so much in need of Jesus. The more I learn about his righteousness, the more I realize I fall short. It's a good thing. Raw truth transforms. You have to be real with yourself. Again, that's why I, I present the truth to you guys, sometimes in such a raw manner. Get uncomfortable. It's good. Because one of these days, you know, we're here on cores, man. Central's right up the block here. There's a lot of people here that are going to make you feel uncomfortable if they walk in our doors. But we want them here. I have never understood churches when people walk in like that. Oh, we no, 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 you got to go. You gotta go. Isn't this what, why we're here? Like we're not just here for, for the people who are perceived to be good people. We're here for everybody. 
The rich person needs Jesus. The middle class person needs Jesus. And the poor person needs Jesus. The drug addict needs Jesus. The prostitute needs Jesus. You know who needs him the most out of that whole group? You. Me. Everybody needs Jesus. It's not a single soul that doesn't. And when you hear somebody say the stupid, well, I have Jesus. You don't have him enough. You need him more, man. Like, you need him more. But raw truth. Jesus flat out tells this father in, in a state of panic and desperation. And again, this sounds really awful. He said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. In the original language, people's not there. It literally just says, Unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. Now it's plural, that's why some of the translations add people because in the Greek that's a plural, a plural word. So it's the idea, he's looking at the people, like, man, you guys, dude. Do you realize I was just with our enemies and they accepted everything I said? I didn't do a single miracle. Maybe he did or didn't. It's not recorded. Not a single miracle is recorded in their presence. And they accepted and they, just, they believed with a whole heart. Here I come to you guys for you guys, and unless I do a tap dance, unless I'm a dancing monkey, you refuse to believe. Why the rebuke? Why the rebuke, especially to a hurting father? I mean, the guy had enough faith to come all the way from Capernaum down to, to Galilee, right? Why the rebuke? You think Jesus would have seen that and marveled and be like, wow. You came all the way down from Capernaum. Well, he knows his heart. We can't know for certainty because the Bible doesn't tell us. It doesn't, it doesn't exclaim to us what it was that, or why, what the reason was that Jesus said this. But we can always speculate. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think we have some solid speculation here. And my speculation is this royal official came to Jesus as a healer. He didn't come to him as Lord and Savior. He came to him as a healer, which understandable because it's likely that this royal official heard of the works that Jesus was doing. Mind you, he's already making a splash. Remember, the Pharisees were already coming out to see him in the wilderness in Judea, so he came back up to, to Capernaum or to Galilee because he wasn't ready for that confrontation. Not that he was afraid, it just wasn't that time. He's already been doing works. He's already been making noise. He's, he turned water into wine here at Cana. Likely that this official himself was down in Jerusalem when Jesus did some of his works down there, some of his preachings. And so it appears that he doesn't see him for who Jesus really is, but it appears that he sees him as a miracle worker. How many people walk in the doors of churches and they don't see Jesus as Lord and Savior, they see him as a good rabbi, a good teacher, a prophet. But they don't see him as the living God. And I'd imagine this is what prompts Jesus to say, unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. You refuse to believe. Again, this is a stark contrast from the belief of the Samaritans who simply believed based on his word. Might I suggest that the difference between the Jews and the Samaritans was an attitude of the heart. It always comes down to the attitude of the heart. The Jews had an attitude of entitlement. They felt like they were owed something. They didn't realize their great need for a savior. Hence, they always they want a sign. They constantly want a sign. Of course the Messiah is with us. Do you know who we are? The attitude should be, I can't believe the Messiah is upon us. Do you know who we are? And I'd imagine that was the attitude of the Samaritans. They knew that they were nothing more than a second class form of Judaism. Just a knockoff, a cheap knockoff. And they probably couldn't believe that God came to them. That's, that's the difference. I believe they had a heart of desperation and the Jews had a heart of entitlement. One of them puts you in a place of surrender. The other puts you in a place of, you owe me. You ever met somebody that has an attitude of entitlement? They walk through life with the attitude that you owe me something. Nothing's ever my fault. It's always your fault. Always your fault. Doesn't matter what happened. If I cooked the meat wrong and got sick, it's your fault. 
If I tripped because I didn't tie my shoelaces, it's your fault. If I get in trouble with the law, it's your fault. I was talking to Jason, right? He was telling me every time he's dealing with guys, when they have the attitude, it's all your fault. It's like, I didn't make you commit any crimes for him. I'm here to do my job. You're the one robbing people. You're the one that's dealing dope. You put yourself in these shoes. My fault. I don't want to be here as much as you don't want to be going. I'm here because you put me in this position to be here. This is my job. Attitude of entitlement. We've raised a generation of Americans with that attitude. America, we all walk around with this attitude that the world owes us something. That's how the Jews were. We're the chosen people of God. You know, I don't even think most Jews of this day or even today understand what they were chosen for. As a matter of fact, you'll hear that term a lot. Oh, they're the chosen people. You guys know what the Jews were chosen for? To what? To suffer. <laughs> to suffer. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, they definitely suffered, but that's not what they were chosen for. You know? A lot of people think that the, the choosing was just to be saved, which they will be. But that's, that's the attitude. Well, they're, they're chosen, so they're, they're automatically in. The Jews have that attitude. They actually, are, we're going to see them say in, in several chapters to come, that, well, we're of Abraham, indicating that pff, we're in, buddy, because of who we are. And Jesus makes sure they understand, no, you're out because you have no faith. You're children of Abraham by blood. God is looking for children of Abraham by faith. But the Jews were chosen to reveal God to the world. That's why they were chosen. Realize, so when they're the chosen people of God, they were chosen to reveal who God was to the world. That's it. That was the choosing. And the climax came in Christ. He was a Jew. God revealed himself to the world in and through the body of Jesus Christ. I wonder why he went back. But that's why the Jews were chosen. So just realize that. Next time you say that or you hear somebody say that, understand why you're saying that and what it is that you're saying. But again, they have this attitude of entitlement because they were chosen. The Samaritans, they were just grateful that God visited them. And they were willing to surrender. I wrote this question in my notes and so I'll ask, do you believe what God says about you? Or do you need some kind of proof or evidence? Do you need some kind of miracle or sign before you're willing to surrender? Or do you believe because God said it? Again, when God says you're forgiven, do you actually believe you're forgiven? You ever heard this one? I just can't forgive myself. I can't. I was talking to somebody. It might have been somebody in here. If it was you, I'm sorry. I didn't speak up because I was like, eh, you know, sometimes I just don't want to argue. But the Bible never says you should forgive yourself. You don't have to forgive yourself. The reality is you just have to really accept that God is forgiving you. If God has forgiven you, if that's not enough, you think you forgiving yourself will ever be enough? Wow. You're not forgiven because you can let it go. You can let it go because God said it's okay. If you can't forgive yourself, you're just exclaiming you haven't accepted Christ's forgiveness. Not that you're not born again, but sometimes we just refuse to let things go. We won't let ourselves get past some things because maybe you just think God's blood wasn't big enough to cover that one. We often live with that attitude that God can forgive you, but he just can't forgive me. No, he can forgive anyone. Just are you willing to surrender and accept his forgiveness? God says you're a new creation. Do you believe him? Do you walk in the newness of life that God gives? When he calls you a child of God, he says you're his. Do you believe him? Or does he have to do some kind of miracle to prove to you that these things are so? This last one that I wrote, he says you've entered into his rest. Hebrews chapter 4 tells us that. Do you believe him? 
Or are you still trying to work your way into salvation? Are you still trying to work your way into the grace of God? I'm here to tell you there's no work you can do that will bring you to the grace of God. Your work will only offend him. I remember I was talking to my dad once. I was helping him bury some of his dogs that passed. He used to breed Dobermans and some of them had passed. And so I had to help him dig this huge hole in the field. And it was like 11 o'clock. And it was, I feel like it was fall or winter. It was pretty cold. But, you know, I had come to a point where I decided I'm not going to share stuff with my dad anymore. Because every time, you know, we start talking about Jesus, man, we get ready to box. And I was like, I want to fight my dad, man. So I'm just like, I'm just going to love him. And... Lord willing, God does something through that. And so we're in the back and, you know, I always took those opportunities. Like I wasn't, I'm not a punk and I'm not going to just, I'm not going to tuck Jesus away. I'm just not going to be in his face about it. And so, and he'd ask me things like, well, how are you doing, son? I'd be like, yeah, God is good, man. I always see you get kind of uncomfortable, you know, I'm like, ah. I was talking about Jesus. I'm like, yeah, if you don't want to hear about Jesus and don't talk to me. But I'm not in your face like I was. So, you know, if you want to ask me how my day was, and we had that talk, like this is what it's going to be. So I was back there helping him, and we were just talking, and I can't remember what, how it came about, but he, I remember him saying, like, well, you know, I'm a pretty good person. And I was like, oh. I said, God says through the prophet Isaiah that the righteous works, the works of the righteous are like filthy rags before him. He didn't care, and I said, let me tell you what that means in Hebrew. He says, your best works before God are like bloody tampons. And his face was like, what did you just say? That's in the Bible? I said, yeah, that's in the Bible. God says your best, the best that you can give him is like a bloody tampon. Because filthy rags are menstrual rags. Because women didn't have tampons, so they put rags, kind of like a pad, you know, down there. And we catch the blood and that's what a filthy rag was. God says your best that you have to offer is that. That's disgusting. That is like cringe. I can't believe I just used that word. You know, it's like a new kid's word. But that's cringeworthy, man. It's like disgusting as all get out. But that's what the Bible says. That's your best. Bloodied tampons. Ugh. <laughs> there is no work you can do to bring you into the grace of God. What you can do is you can enter into His rest. You can enter into his work that he's already accomplished. That's what you can do. That is what God offers you. You can't do anything to win his favor. You can surrender. That's what God wants. And God will do works through you as you surrender, by all means. You're not born again just to do nothing. God wants to do great things for you. But you don't do things now to gain grace or gain favor with God. You're in his grace and you're with his favor. You do them because you're His and you have the desire to be His and do His work. Do you believe God or are you still trying to work your way into His grace? In verse 49, so again 48, Jesus says, unless you believe, unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. Unless I do a tap dance for you guys, there's nothing. Verse 49, He says, the royal official said to Him, Sir, come down before my child dies. He ignores Jesus' assessment of him. And he continues to pour out his heart. Sir, come down, please. My child's going to die. When he says child in this verse here, he makes it more intimate. The idea behind this word, is it's, it's not like, like my son. In our culture, we would say, my baby boy is dying. This is my baby, sir. Please. We know how that is, right? Like, you can be 10 years old, but that's your baby. And that's the idea. He makes it a very, um, it's a very enduring term. But he said, please, come down. And I love verse 50. Jesus said to him, go, your son lives. Jesus meets this man where he's at. He doesn't fully submit to the man's request. The guy wants him to come. I need you to come. If you can come, he'll live. Jesus says, I'm not going, but I'll tell you what, your son lives. Go. Now this man has a choice. Believe him or not. And it says, he believed. Again, verse 
50, he said, go, your son lives. The man believed the word of Je- that Jesus spoke to him and started off. He meets him where he is. He wants him to come. But Jesus wants something in return. He doesn't want money. He wants his faith. He wants his belief. That's what Jesus wants of us. You know, there's nothing more pleasing to God than you're trusting him. Why come to church and I do all these wonderful things? Yeah, that's cool. That's not what God wants from you. I'm convinced that when we get to heaven, the person that we're going to see most exalted out of the church is going to be people you don't expect. We probably think of, think of some big names. Who do you think like is going to be high class in heaven? Billy Graham? Yeah. Skip Isaac, maybe? Yeah. George Whitfield. George, <laughs> George Whitfield, yeah. That's a powerful dude, right? These are big names. Charles Spurgeon. So for some of you guys that aren't that, you know, tune in. Walter. <laughs> I'd be lucky to clean the bathroom floors up there, you know, but I'll take it, you know. <laughs> and I don't even get a nice scrubber. I get a toothbrush. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but, you know, and, and, and we think that, you know, we think that these people are going to be these magnificent people in heaven and they're going to be you know, the Apostle Paul's going to be up there. Wow. And I'm convinced that it's going to be nobodies you've never heard of or seen. They're going to be the most magnified. In it. Well, Jesus is going to be the most magnified. But you know what I mean? Because the Bible says that we are reaping and sowing and receiving rewards in heaven. And I believe it's going to be people that you and I have never heard of or seen. What'd you do in heaven? Oh, I clean bathrooms for a living. And why am I looking up to you and not down at you? Because I'm convinced that there are many janitors out there who are faithful with every little thing that God asks Amen. of them. And I believe there's many great pastors and great Bible teachers who are unfaithful in so many areas of their life. Uh-oh. Not necessarily that they're doing nasty sins, they're just obeying the Lord at every turn. I believe that there are those who we don't expect that are going to be the most lifted up in the sight of the Lord because they're faithful. I know a lot of us here think that, well, we don't get much in heaven because like, I'm not the pastor. I'm not teaching people. No, but you can be faithful for the, with what God has set before you. If God has asked you to clean bathrooms, you clean that bathroom like nobody's ever cleaned a bathroom. And you're building treasure in heaven because you're doing what God asked of you. And before you know it, don't be shocked when God has you cleaning hearts. Scrub that toilet bowl because before you know it, you'll be scrubbing people's consciences with the word of God. You don't know what God's doing. You, all you need to know is that you should be faithful today. This man wants Jesus to come. Jesus wants his faith. Believe me, man. Don't come to me as a miracle worker. I'm more than that, dude. If all I am is a miracle worker, I have nothing for you. Because you're still dead in your sin. Your son will live, but you'll both go to hell. What good is that? He tells him, go. Your son lives. He addresses the more important aspect of the man's request. The man wants him to come to save his dying son. He says, your dying son is saved. Go. The the man believed, so he took off home. Verse 51, as he was going down, his slaves met him saying that his son was living. Now, where am I? I think I skipped something. No, I didn't. As he was going down, His slaves met him saying that his son was living. So he inquired of them the hour when he began to get better. Then they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So he takes off and again, we don't know exactly if he went straight to Capernaum or if not. When it says the seventh hour, you know, I read a lot of commentaries. Because in my mind, you guys remember what the seventh hour should be? It should be one o'clock. According to Jewish time. Roman time is more on the lines of our time frame. 7 o'clock, we would call that p.m. For the Jews, the seventh hour would have been 1 p.m. because they started their hour at 6 a.m. 6 a.m. or sunrise, around 6 a.m. is the first hour. And then throughout the day, it succeeds and goes all the way up until nighttime. And so for the seventh hour on Jewish time, 1 o'clock. If they're on the Roman time, 7 o'clock. We don't know which one. We presume he's talking about the Jewish hour because he's a Jew. But then again, he's also referring to the Roman official. Working in Herod's court, it's likely that they're working off the Roman time frame. 
We don't know. Either way, the guy doesn't get there till the next day. So even if it is like 1 p.m., it's still going to take him to the next day to get to Capernaum. Because again, once night falls, you know, travel again at night. Not a smart move. So he gets back into town the next day, and he's met by some of his officials, his slaves. So I mean, he's high enough to have slaves, so maybe he's higher up than I thought. No. Again, it doesn't tell us the position, so we don't know. But they say, your son's better. So what hour? Yesterday. Seventh hour, he was better. And it says the man knew immediately. That's the hour that Jesus said he's healed. He believed, verse 53, he says. So the father knew that it was at the hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. In verse 50, it said he already believed. When Jesus says, go, your son lives, it says he believed him and he took off immediately. That was at the seventh hour. It appears that we're going to stick with the Jewish hour, one o'clock. He immediately takes off and starts heading home. Again, has to pull over to camp before he can get to, the, to Capernaum for the, you know, for the rest of the night. He has to wait. Then he takes off and he gets back into the city and your son lives. Seventh hour. He believed, but it tells us he already believed. So what's the meaning of this here? So did he not actually believe the first time around? No, I believe he believed. That's why he took off. The idea here is indicating a confirmation, strengthening the already established belief. Oftentimes, God will call you to do something. And you are to believe. Now, God will also allow things to take place, to transpire, to strengthen that belief. I'll give you an example. Like, again, we're, we're, we're kind of waiting for this spot to open up. Like, I don't, I'm in limbo here. I don't know what God's doing. I'm like, I have a feeling like he's going to open up. I believe he's going to open it up. And so God has done several little things to help strengthen my faith. Whether it's this spot or another spot, I believe God is preparing to move us in a beautiful way into a bigger spot. One of the things he did was he provided us 200 chairs. Dope. He provided us some couches for the new spot. Dope, yeah, like, it's funny because the couches match the chairs. I don't know how that happened. But they're the exact same color as the chairs. No, We'll just call it a God thing. Cool. And I believe God is prepared. Like every time something little like this happens, it strengthens my faith. All right, God, maybe you are doing something here that I'm just, I, just, I can't see, so I'm just going to be patient and wait. Your time, not mine, Lord. So realize when God tells you something and you believe, he'll often bring things to confirm to strengthen that already established belief. So when it says here that he believed, it's confirming the belief that he already established when Jesus said, go, your son lives. That's the idea. Now, it's important here when we look at verse 53 to note, he himself believed and his whole household. His whole household. That truth cannot be overlooked. The importance of a father's faith. There's a statistic that I read. I don't know how updated this is, but this is how I remember it, and I looked it up, and it's still on the internet, so I'm going to give it to you as, you know, as I learned it, and I'd imagine it's still pretty close. They say that in a household where none of the parents attend church, that there's a 6% chance that your children will end up walking with the Lord in their adult years. So if, if you have kids and you didn't attend church in their younger years, there's a 6% chance that in their adult years they'll attend. If the mother regularly attends church in the kid's adolescence, it jumps from 6% to about 17%. of 17% chance. So if moms, if you're serving the Lord, there's a 17% chance that when your child's older, they'll regularly attend church and serve the Lord. Not a bad jump, right? It's terrible. However, fathers, if just the father serves the Lord and attends church regularly, no mom, mom's out there doing her own thing, dad alone, that figure jumps from 17% to 93% chance that your children in their adult years will attend church and serve the Lord. Now what if mom and dad, the figure doesn't change from the father? That tells me something. 
That tells me that the importance of a father in the household is absolutely necessary. That it's imperative, it's, it's extraordinarily important that fathers be present in the lives of their children and set the bar, set the example. It makes you wonder why our government is so keen on removing fathers from the household. I wonder not, right? They have this want to be daddy in the lives of their constituents. Right? There's benefits for women. That's why today's women, they're all about, do, get my nails, didn't do my thing. I don't need no man. I'm an independent woman. You're a moron. <laughs> That's what you are. You bought, the, you bought the lie. You bit the poison apple. You're stupid. I ain't even a slave. You're just stupid. I'm going to stick with that. I stand on that. I'm offended. Yeah, you're, you're stupid and offended. It doesn't change the fact that you're stupid. Independent woman. Yeah. Go let government be your daddy. And watch your kids go to hell. You wonder why government, as we drift further away from God, why they want men feminized. Look at the feminist movement. It's not even feminism. And you know what feminism is supposed to be? The empowerment of women. Do you know what feminism is today? <laughs> it's disgusting. But more particularly, feminism is just the degrading of a man. It's not even about women. It's about, it's about talking down on men and, 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 and belittling men. That's all feminism has become. I wonder why. Is the feminine movement pro Jesus? No, it's not pro Jesus, man. Like they, they might say, "Well, we believe in Jesus." I don't know what Jesus you believe in. You believe in that Mormon Jesus or something? Because it ain't our Jesus, bro. And Jehovah's Witness Jesus, because it's not our Jesus. You believe in the Muslim Jesus? Jesus, Muslims believe in Jesus. No, they do. It's not our Jesus, because if they did, they'd worship him. You do not believe in the biblical Jesus. You cannot stand as a true feminist, at least in today's age, for what they stand for, and be a legitimate Bible-believing Christian because by and far, everything they teach is anti-biblical. It's anti-Jesus. They are pro-removing the man from the home. That's why most feminists are single or divorced. That's why strong marriages don't have feminism involved. I wonder why there's such a want to remove the man from the home. If the man leads, there's a 93% chance that the children will follow one route. <clears throat> Moms, how is it when you try and discipline your kids? How does that work out for you? I'm not saying it doesn't have its moments. Is it the same effect as when dad steps in? It's just not because there's something different about the nature of the father and the mother. That's just nature. You don't have to be a Christian for that. My parents weren't Christians when I was a kid, and I was terrified of my dad. I knew that if my dad got involved, I messed up. And it, it wasn't going to turn out good for me. My mom, I, her threats meant nothing to me. My dad, he didn't have to be there. All she had to do was say, wait till your dad gets home. Oh, I remember I was at my grandma's once, and I was doing something. I, mean, I made my mom so mad, she slapped me. And I laughed at her. Oh, she turned red. Wait till your dad gets here. Mom, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Please don't tell dad. Please, mom. I started begging her. Like, please. I don't think she told him because I didn't get my butt. I would have got my butt handed to me that day. I, I, I didn't. So she must have caved because I started begging her. Please don't tell dad. Because those of you who know my dad. <laughs> yeah, nah. Yeah, nah. That would not have went well for me. But I'll tell you what, as hard as my dad was, he was there. And as hard of a man as he was, there was a distinction between me and kids who didn't have a dad. There was a, even me and my punk years, there was a, a respect about me that wasn't about a lot of my friends. Like we'd have dinner at one of the guys' house and all the other guys would just make a mess and go off and run off and I'd stay back and help the parents clean up the kitchen and stuff because that's how my dad taught me to do. It stuck with me. Even as I was out there being a punk, selling dope, gangbanging and... Nah, you don't have to help. Nah, man, you guys fed me. The least I could do is throw the trash, clean up the table, or do the dishes if they let me. Because I was taught to respect. 
There is something about the presence of a father that's necessary to a child's life. I'll be straight with you. Fathers in our generation, we're failing our children. Actually, there's more dudes in here than normal. For a while, there it was just women. It's so necessary that fathers step up and be men. And it's not even just about being a man. It's about being a man of God. Amen. Amen. We don't just need men. We need men of God. We need men who are going to love their wives and their children. We need men who are going to be kind and patient and protective. We need godly men. We don't need more thugs. We don't need macho men. I'm not afraid to love my wife and my kids. Does that make me a punk? If you think I'm a punk, you don't know me. We need men of God to stand up. The man believed and his whole household followed. His faith was a springboard for the rest of the family. Now again, his faith can't make them saved, but this, the faith is a springboard. In verse 54, this is again a second sign that Jesus performed when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. He says this is a second sign. John, in his gospel, he only records eight signs of Christ. But we know why he records these eight signs. And the whole purpose of the gospel of John is, is so that you would believe. Believe what? Believe in Jesus, that he's God that he's the savior of the world. Believe. And this was the second sign that he performed. Now how does today's text springboard us into believing that Jesus is the living God? Well, I want you to note something. He healed this royal official son without being present. Who can do that? Only God. What does that make Jesus? Makes him God. Because only God can do such a thing. I mean, if he went there and put his hands on him, maybe he was like, you know, witchcraft. I don't know. This dude's 25 miles away. He says, go, your son's healed. I trust you. I'll go. He shows up, his son's healed. It was done so that they would believe. So, I want to encourage you guys, as God continues to draw you in and to speak to you, believe him. You don't need signs and wonders to establish your faith. Believe him. Signs and wonders might come. God might establish his truth and confirm it in other ways, but just trust him where you're at now. But, Father, we thank you for being God and for your goodness, mercy, and grace. I thank you for this beautiful body of people. And I pray that you would bless them and protect them and lead them, Father, guide them throughout the rest of this coming week. I pray that you would shine your grace through them into the lives of those who are around them and I pray that you would uphold them with your righteous right hand I pray Heavenly Father that uh, that we wouldn't try to work our way into your grace but that we would accept the free gift that you give we love you so much Lord we thank you for being our God in Jesus name Amen